It's important to know that Nicodemus was no fool. It's easy to look down on him, to hear his questions to Jesus and think, man, he really didn't get it, did he? But Nicodemus was no fool. In fact, he was the opposite of that. Nicodemus was a teacher. Nicodemus had the credentials. Nicodemus had the education. Nicodemus was part of what was called the Sanhedrin. It says in our text he was a leader of the Jews. He was on the great council. There were 70 of those men who were kind of like, I suppose, in a way, our supreme court. Nicodemus was no fool, is my point. And so when we hear him questioning Jesus, we shouldn't just throw his questions out the window and say, well, look at this guy. He doesn't understand anything. I think it's helpful to know that Nicodemus was no fool. He understood things. He had the credentials, and they weren't fake. Nicodemus sat on the Sanhedrin. He was, like Jesus said, one of the teachers of Israel. And as one of those teachers of Israel, Nicodemus was very much concerned with the life of Israel. Nicodemus was very much concerned that the people of God, the Israelites, should know the truth about God and that the people of God should live like the people of God. And so he comes to Jesus with questions. He comes to Jesus at night so that there wouldn't be any interruptions, so that there wouldn't be anyone who butts in and says, well, but answer my question first, Jesus. No, Nicodemus comes at night so that he can have a long talk with Jesus. And as someone who was no fool, as someone who sat on the great Sanhedrin, Nicodemus was well-versed in new beginnings. That's what he and Jesus were speaking of that night. What will it take for us to get a new start, Jesus? What will it take for the kingdom of God to really become evident? What will it take for the people of God, for us Israelites, to really finally make it in this world? It's a good question, isn't it? What will it take for the kingdom of God to be manifest? What will it take to have a new beginning, to have a fresh start, to have, like Jesus says, this new birth? Now, I mentioned Nicodemus was well-versed in new beginnings. And just remember some of those new beginnings in the Old Testament. Remember that first of all beginnings, how Adam, the first man, our father, was made. Remember how it happened? God took the earth, right? Adam was born out of Mother Earth. God took that dust of the earth and breathed into him his living spirit. That was the first new beginning, but it didn't last long, did it? That first new beginning ended in a first drastic fall. And the story of Scripture ever since then has been one of new beginnings and even deeper falls, Nicodemus would have been well-versed in those new beginnings. He would have known the story of Noah's flood, how God deluged the world so that it could start over. He would have remembered how that new beginning, which must have seemed so promising at the time for Noah and his sons, at last, the world is clean. At last, we can have a fresh start. But Nicodemus knew, just like you do, that that fresh start ended rather poorly. Nicodemus knew that the world after the flood was cleansed, but it was just like the world before the flood. And so so instead of going from glory to glory, Noah's sons ended up building the Tower of Babel. Nicodemus would have been well-versed not only in that new beginning of the flood, but he would have remembered that greatest of all new beginnings, how God brought his people Israel out of Pharaoh's realm. How he gave birth, if you will, to a whole nation in one day. But Nicodemus would have remembered that even when Israel passed through the Red Sea, even when they had seen all of the mighty works of God, when they finally got to Mount Sinai, instead of worshiping the Lord, what did they do? They built a golden calf. Nicodemus was well-versed in the new beginnings of Israel, but he was equally well-versed in all of the falls. And you could go through the rest of the stories of the Old Testament, how they crossed over the Jordan River, a fresh start, and then didn't conquer the land. He would have known how David's kingdom began and Saul's kingdom was put away, but David's sons fell further 
than David ever did. Nicodemus would have known about the great reforms of Israel, how the kings had come up and put away the idols, kings like Josiah, who carried out wonderful reformations, only to return to rampant idolatry. Nicodemus would have known, just like you know, how God had always, over and over again, given his people a fresh start, a new beginning, a new birth. He would have remembered how the people came out of exile, how they came back into the land, and how, no matter how much things seemed to change, they always stayed the same. Nicodemus knew that full well, just like you know it. If all of those didn't work, Jesus, if all of those new beginnings, if all of those new births couldn't bring about the kingdom of God, what makes you any different, Jesus? Can you really do what Moses couldn't? Can you do what Joshua didn't? Can you finish what David only started, what Josiah couldn't bring about? Are you really able to succeed, to succeed where the rest failed? And Jesus' answer is, absolutely. Jesus does not come to give a new birth like all the other ones. Jesus comes to give a real, heavenly birth. You heard him put it this way, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And that, Jesus says, is what I have come to bring about. A new birth that is actually new, a different birth that is actually different. What the Passover, what the exile, what the conquest was always pointing ahead to, Jesus is telling Nicodemus on this night, he has come to bring about. Now think about that desire to have a fresh start. Because it isn't just Nicodemus and the Israelites who see that things around are kind of bad. A new beginning, a fresh start, a regeneration is something that every nation, that every people wants to have. Especially when you live in kind of rotten, decaying times like ours. We look around and we want new births, don't we? We want fresh starts. We want things to start over and to end up in a different place to be better than they used to be. No matter how much people say, I have no regrets, if you scratch a little deeper, people will say, well, actually, I'd like to have it all over again. But the way that we go about getting that new beginning, getting that fresh start, getting that regeneration is impossible if it is left to us. That which is born of the flesh, Jesus says, remains flesh. So just think this morning of the different ways that our world tries to grasp for a new birth. We try to grasp for things that seem to have the power to give us new life, right? And so one of the most common ways is that people turn to education. Let's give more education. Let's go to school longer. And I can understand the attraction of that, right? Education is able to do amazing things, to give people new possibilities, to, give, to open up a door into a world that if you didn't have the education, you wouldn't get. And yet, all of the education in the world cannot bring about the new birth from above. No matter how long you go to school, no matter how soon you get a fresh start, just look at that huge building behind St. Paul's when you leave this morning. Even if you are in school from the time you are three to the time you are 33, you aren't going to have the new birth because our problem, right, our problem is deeper than the mind. Adam did not sin because he didn't have enough knowledge. Adam was not lacking in education in the garden, and the people of Israel throughout the Old Testament didn't need greater education. They needed something that went deeper. Our world also looks for other powerful forces, right? Education can be a powerful thing, and so can political action. And so people often throw in their hopes, their dreams, everything that they want into just getting the right politicians who can pass the right laws. Every time there's some kind of tragedy, that's where people kind of turn first, isn't it? If only we could reform the system. If only we could get some new laws on the book, then we could have a new start. Then we could have a new beginning. Then we could have a fresh start, and everything would be fixed. And look, those things are important. Those things are powerful. 
Government is not some kind of evil thing by its nature. But turning to political action will not solve a sin problem. You've heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating over and over again because the world outside doesn't understand this. You cannot sin your way into a problem and vote your way out. We cannot sin our way into a problem and look to the government to save us. It doesn't have the power. But what does? What can give us a fresh start? What can give us new life? We look for the most powerful things, the power of a good education, the power of the government, maybe the power of mass media. The truth is that propaganda works, doesn't it? The the truth is that even those of us who kind of pride ourselves in not paying much attention to social media, to the news, we are affected, all of us, by these things. The propaganda channels work. They form our thoughts. They form our minds. And so it's tempting to believe that if we could just get the right messages out on Facebook, if we just had the right hashtags, if just the right things would go viral, then everything would be fixed. But even mass media, with all of its power, cannot give the new birth. And so some people just resign themselves to the fact that there's never going to be a new birth. And in fact, they say, you know what the real problem is? The real problem is in trying. The real problem is in wanting the new birth. Why not just be the way that you were born? Why not just embrace the flesh? Why not just sink into what we have and just be tolerant of everything? They coat themselves in a rainbow, God's symbol of the new world. They resign themselves to simply being what they feel that they are. And yet Jesus says, you must be born again. Truth is that that message, that message is so insidious and it is so prevalent all around us that I want to be clear about it this morning. The new humanity, the new birth, is not going to be covered in the LGBTQIA plus rainbow. Just think of what's hidden under that plus. There is no end to that plus. There is no end to that rainbow. There is no end to all of the colors that will be added and to the further degradations that those things bring. For as much as they proclaim tolerance, as much as it is shouted in our ears, as much as it is shown all around us, it does not bring truth. It does not bring goodness. It does not bring beauty. It brings the opposite of those things. That rainbow, that flag is not the sign of God's new birth. It will not do to simply say, well, if education won't do it, if government won't do it, if mass media won't do it, then what's the point? Jesus says loud and clear, you must be born again, born from above, not from the abyss below. And he says, he says that there is hope. He says that there is a new birth that comes from above, that it is not inaccessible, that it is not unavoidable, that it is not inescapable, but that he has come to bring that new birth and that new life that we all so desperately want. What education cannot do, what politics cannot effect, what mass media cannot even form in you, Jesus has come to bring about. For that regeneration that he speaks of is possible. It is possible from above. For Jesus has come to us, dear friends, from above. He has come down from heaven to earth to bring a new birth. He has come down and joined himself to our flesh so that our flesh may share in his life-giving spirit. Jesus is the one who is born from on high, not Moses, not David, not Josiah. What all of those Old Testament things were just a shadow of, Jesus is the reality. Think of that, right? If you were to see my shadow on the ground in front of you this morning, you could see my outline, you could see sort of my shape. But at once I would step into the light, you would say, forget about the shadow, right? That's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Jesus is saying those shadows, those figures, those types, those previews couldn't bring the new birth. But I, the real thing, I have come to bring it about. And in fact, when you look at the life of Jesus, what do you see? You see this man who is born again. You see this man who is born from above. 
For he is the Son of God incarnate by the power of the Spirit, and he is baptized by water and the Spirit in that Jordan River. And there you see, you see Jesus standing in with sinners, standing in with sinners not to console them in their sin, but to save them from their sin. Jesus is the one who is born of water and the Spirit in his incarnation, in his baptism, and most especially in his resurrection. For once he rises from the dead, what does he do? He comes and he goes like the wind. You remember how it was, don't you? You remember how the disciples were all huddled together in fear on that first Easter evening? And then whoosh, here comes Jesus. Where did he come from? Who knows? But he comes and he bestows on them his peace. He comes and he gives to them his spirit. And then he goes like the wind. And he comes and he goes and no one knows what he is up to. Well, until he tells them. I have come to give peace. And then he sends them. You now go out into all the world to give this new life, to give this new birth, to give this fresh start, to give this new beginning that will not end in disappointment, in the forgiveness of sins. How can you do that, Jesus? That was Nicodemus' question. And the answer Jesus gives him is loud and clear, isn't it? I will do it by dying on the cross. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so I will be lifted up on the cross. See, here's the answer to our hopes and our dreams because here is the answer to the actual problem. Our problem is not a intellectual problem. Our problem is not a political problem. Our problem is a sin problem, a death problem. And so Jesus says, I will take that problem, sin and death, into myself. I will be lifted up on the cross to die in your place so that I may also rise in your place and give you a share in that life. How can this be any different Well, because with God, all things are possible. Sin and death and judgment meet their match in our Lord Jesus Christ. He takes care of our problems through his cross, and by his resurrection, he brings to you now a real living hope, a hope for a new beginning that will actually carry through to a new ending. Right? You can rewind a movie all you want, but it will always end up in the same place in the end, right? Unless you put in a totally different movie. That's what Jesus gives you when he gives you his Holy Spirit. He gives you a completely new start. He gives you a completely new life. And here is the joy of Trinity Sunday, that that new life, that new life is under the reign, the rule of the loving Holy Trinity. Why do we make such a big deal about this three and one and one and three and co-equal, co-eternal, co-majestic? Do you have that thought as we're saying the Athanasian Creed? Here's what it boils down to. The reason that we glory in these things is because the Trinity is the God of love. He is not one who simply loves himself. He is the Father who glorifies the Son, the Son who honors the Father, and the Spirit who magnifies each and the other. And so when you come into that new beginning, when you come under his reign, you are not put under an oppressive power. You are not put under some kind of terrible, awful burden. You come under the life of love that the Father has for his Son, that the Son has for his Father. You enter into that new kind of life. United with Jesus, you have this new birth, born again of water and the Spirit, born from above of holy baptism. You share in this kingdom of love. What Nicodemus looked for, what Nicodemus was on the verge of giving up, Jesus brought about. And being united to his regeneration, being joined to the regenerate one, means that you have now a new source and a new ending. The grave is not your ending. The ground is not your, where you belong. You have an ending in heaven. And that changes things, doesn't it? It changed Nicodemus' life. I don't know if you know the rest of Nicodemus' story, but it took a very different turn than the rest of the guys on the Sanhedrin. Everyone else on the Sanhedrin was opposed to Jesus. Everyone else on the Sanhedrin went along with the high priest Caiaphas, but not Nicodemus. You remember, don't you, how when Jesus was taken down from the cross, who took him and buried him in the grave? It was Nicodemus. I bet Caiaphas didn't like that. I bet the rest of the guys on the Sanhedrin looked at him and said, what the heck are you doing? But Nicodemus knew 
that life joined to Jesus was real life, that in him there was a new birth, a new start. And so when Nicodemus laid the body of Jesus in the ground, in the tomb, where Adam was first born, I wonder, don't you, if Nicodemus remembered these words of Jesus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You also have come to share in that new birth, in that new beginning, in that new life. And just like Nicodemus experienced, you will experience people looking at you and saying, what the heck are you doing? But when they ask that question, when they look at you sideways, remember Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus who did not put his hope in what the old world could not do, but who put his hope in what Jesus did, what Jesus does, what Jesus will bring about. And join Nicodemus, join Jesus in that new birth, in that regeneration, for that is the life that will not end in the grave. That is the life that will end in the joys of heaven. To Christ be the glory now and always. Amen.